Thank you for the invitation to preach here. I've not preached here. I've taken a lesson here, but not preached here. And I've played here before, but this is good. Um, I accept the invitation because even though this last minute I had a sermon prepared because I preached it at Toon Gabby last week. So uh, I have been doing a series in Toon Gabby starting from the first chapter of Genesis. And the mo to me, the most important verse in the whole Bible is the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you believe that, you can believe anything that is in the Bible because without faith it is impossible to please him. If you doubt here, you will doubt everywhere else where there's a difficult passage. The Bible hangs on this verse, in the beginning, God, and particularly in this day and age when uh, science tells us, you know, this, this is just a fairy story. And even ministers uh, of the gospel and priests uh, do not accept the first 11 chapters of Genesis. They say it's an allegory, not in my book. That is the foundation on which our faith is based. If you destroy the foundation, all your assumptions are wrong. If your assumptions are wrong, your conclusions are, are wrong and you destinately will be wrong. It's as simple as that. The whole Bible hangs on this verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I've been doing chapter by chapter through Genesis. But I thought it prudent to, uh, you know, to change things a little this time. Everybody's singing carols. I play in a band, and we've been playing Christmas carols at the shopping center. That's beautiful, yeah. It's been beautiful at uh, Blackdown Shopping Center. And people enjoy it. They enjoy listening to the carols. And I thought, well, it's, it's Christmas. It comes but once a year. Why not? And so I ventured to uh, reread and... Uh, mull over the thoughts of my mind as I studied uh, and the, the, the title of my sermon today is The Almost Forgotten Man of Christmas now you and I all know the story we know, we see the nativity uh, uh, little setups in all the uh, shopping centers and all looks so uh, sanitized <laughs> But it was anything but on that night. But when God in the fullness of time sent his son Jesus into the world, he chose the perfect vessel for his son to be born. He chose Mary, the virgin Mary. But you know, since the birth would be a vir virgin birth, there would be no need for a human male to take part in this birth, to father the child. However, however, because Jesus was coming into the world as a baby, as a helpless infant, and since God was sending his son into the world to live in poverty and not in splendor, there would be need for someone to provide for the needs and to care for this child. And I have just omitted something. Let's just bow our heads. Loving Father in heaven, we are thankful for thy word. We are thankful for thy grace toward us in giving us thy son. We are thankful for the instruction that thou hast provided for us. Bless us as we study, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, God would need a caretaker and a provider for his son. Now, God could do that by himself. He didn't need humans, but he decided in his wisdom, because this would be the son of man, he decided to, uh, we needed a man. Now, 
I want to look at the story of this man, the almost forgotten man of Christmas. You know, there's only one hymn that I know of where Joseph is mentioned even. That's the one we just sang. Every other song is, uh, Christmas song is on Jesus or Mary, but not Joseph. He's only mentioned once in this song we just sang. Now, here's what we know of Joseph. His father's name was Jacob. He was from the royal line of David. Three, he was a humble man. Four, he was a religious man, a devout keeper of the law. Five, he was a poor man. His family, six, his family was from Bethlehem. And seven, he was betrothed to a virgin. Now, betrothal, in our language, we'd say an engagement. And the practice was that they would be engaged for between six months and a year. They did not live together, but they were regarded as husband and wife. And eight, the eighth point is that he was a carpenter by trade. Now, in heaven's estimation, this was no ordinary man, although there's not much written about him. He appears to be one of Scripture's shadow figures. He's there, but not much is said about him. But he's there just where God wants him. Joseph's story does not begin with an angel. an angel appearing to him. He was a just man. Matthew 1 describes him as a just man, a fair man, a widower, and obviously a kind and merciful man. His story is different to the accounts of Zacharias and Mary and Elizabeth and also the shepherds. His story is different. Let's look at a few of those. Zacharias, Luke describes, we're doing, dealing with two chapters, two or three chapters. First in Luke, Luke chapter one. And uh, it tells you, you can follow it there with me if you like. But uh, Luke and Matthew one, we'll, we'll deal with that. Zacharias is a priest. And in the order of the priestly routine and roster, he is there offering incense. And while he's, while he's busy in his priestly um, duties, an angel appears to him standing on the right side of the altar and tells him that he is going to have a son and that he must name him John. Now, he doesn't quite believe. He doesn't quite believe the angel. And so he, he, he is struck dumb for nine months. Just think about that for a while. Being dumb for nine months. But in due time, even though his wife Elizabeth is well past childbearing age, she becomes pregnant. Now here's an interesting question in, in Luke uh, 1 verse 24. It says, Elizabeth hid herself for five months. Interesting. The Bible doesn't say why, and I'll leave you to figure this one out. And you can use a little sanctified imagination as to why, but just bear in mind that they were, she was considered barren, and they were in their 60s and 70s. So... That's one for you to work out. In due course, he has a son, and he names him John, and his tongue is loosed. He can now speak. In obedience to the angel's command, when uh, he names him John, which is totally out of character for the Jews. John, nobody's in your family that's named John. You know, they even protested. 
The background of Mary's story is somewhat different. Mary's story begins with the fact that she is a virgin, living in Nazareth, poor, and is betrothed to a man named Joseph, and she is happily anticipating her wedding day. You know, now, a young teenage girl anticipating her wedding day. Think about that. We need to immerse ourselves in these stories a little bit and, and, and try to follow and place ourselves in the situation. She's excited about a wedding. She's excited about the wedding feast and all of that. God breaks into the story now. Six months after the angel had appeared to Zacharias, he appears to this young teenage Mary, this young teenager. Look at the contrast. First, he appears to the aged, Zacharias, and and then he appears to this young teenager, Mary. There's a lesson in that. See the contrast. Each time, the angel Gabriel brings news of a child to be born and both impossible births. Both of them impossible. This aged couple is well, well past the childbearing age. And this is a virgin, on the other hand. Look at Luke 1 verse 28. Luke 1 verse 28, and the the greeting troubles Mary somewhat. Luke 1 verse 28, and it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail. He was the first one to hail Mary. Now, I don't mean it in that other sense. But he was, Gabriel was the first one to hail Mary. Look Look at that verse again. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, she's troubled by that, and, the, and Gabriel tells her not to fear. But Gabriel brings a shocking piece of news to her, that she is going to have a child. What God asks Mary to do will change her life forever. Gone are her plans for a beautiful wedding and a wedding feast. Gone. In that moment, her dreams are shattered. She will be married, but not before there are rumors that are spread through the village. She will have children, but over her family, there will be a cloud of suspicion and doubt. And all this will happen, but not in the way that she expected. He tells her that she will become pregnant and she asks the question, how can this be? It's impossible. Seeing I know not a man. Gabriel explains it to her and gives her evidence in verse 36. Look at verse 36 and you see the evidence. God provides evidence always. Verse 36 And behold, Abriel tells her, Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. See the evidence? So, what asks God, what Mary gets is not just a shocking news, but a better understanding of what God is now asking her to do and he gives her the evidence that this is true. Now notice her answer. It is one of the, to me this is one of the great statements of faith in the Bible, especially in the light of the destruction of all her plans and all her hopes. Mary says yes to God. Yes to the impossible. Yes, to the plan of God. Now, let's not underestimate what it cost Mary to say yes to God. 
she would soon know that saying yes to God mean, meant public shame and misunbelief and disbelief. Misunderstanding and disbelief. A virgin going to have a baby? Really? She also had no way of knowing how Joseph would react to the news that the girl that he was engaged to had become pregnant. We need to think about these, these things a little bit. The girl he had be, become engaged to was now pregnant. And she thinks, this, would he walk out on her? Would he humiliate her? Would he divorce her? Would he believe her? And this is where it gets interesting. Like every man, Joseph was looking to the day when he and Mary would be married and live their lives together. Now, two weeks ago, my wife and I celebrated 56 years of marriage. And uh, I can still remember the excitement I felt when I, we went shopping for the furniture, you know, and I had the house, I bought the house, and uh, preparing everything, getting everything ready. I can still remember. I still have it dearly. I made sure that everything was just right. Everything had to be in place, prepared for the time when I would bring her home as my bride. And Joseph, no doubt, had dreams like that. He was busy in the carpenter shop, preparing the home, making the fine furniture that they would share together. And like a cruel slap in the face comes this bad news that shatters all his hopes and dreams. Mary is pregnant and he is not the father. Must have hurt as every dream he had came crashing down around him. One can only imagine the reaction, the shock, anger, disappointment, embarrassment. Can you blame him for not believing her story about the angel? Can you blame him? The Bible doesn't say. What did he say to her? The Bible doesn't tell us that. In fact, nowhere in the birth accounts are there any recorded words of Joseph. Not anywhere. For him, it was a time of shattered dreams, and now he is faced with a huge dilemma. He, he truly wanted to believe, he was troubled, and he truly wanted to believe that this girl that he dearly loved, he wanted to believe her. But the doubt comes, and it seems that she has been unfaithful to him. Hmm. He does not want to embarrass her publicly. And he does not want to see her stoned to death because he still loves her. So in his mind, the best course is to divorce her privately. A decision that must have caught him, caused him great sadness. Now he knows that the law is quite clear. That a woman found guilty of adultery should be stoned to death. And that's in Deuteronomy 22 22 verse 20 to 22. You can check that out yourself. She should be stoned to death. But there is another option that is open to him. And look at Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. Look at the, op the other option that's open to him. 24 verse 1 and it says when a man hath taken a wife and married her and it come to pass that she find that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her in her hand and send her out of his house so there was that option open to him as it turns out he decides to put her away privately. 
In doing so, before we get there, Joseph is faced with this dilemma. And uh, the Bible shows that even faithful, strong men sometimes hesitate to accept the challenge that God hands them. Moses protested that he couldn't speak well enough to be God's spokesman. Jeremiah objected that he was but a child. Jonah ran away from his assignment. But again, God intervenes here. And Joseph was prepared to put her away privately. But God intervenes. And now we turn to Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 1. Let's look at Matthew 1. For another part of this story. Matthew 1 verse 19 to 25 reveals something of the qualities of this man. The sterling qualities of this man. The angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. And explains all about the conception and tells him not to fear but to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Notice something, that she is already regarded by heaven as his wife. Take unto thee Mary thy wife. And he explains to Joseph the purpose of this miracle and tells him what name to give the child. It changes Joseph's mind. When he awakes, his mind is made up and every step he takes testifies to the greatness of the silent, forgotten man of Christmas. But there are three things to note. By marrying her quickly, he broke the Jewish custom, but in doing so, he protected Mary's reputation. She was pregnant, and he was not the father, but he married her anyway. Two, by keeping her a virgin until Jesus was born, he protected the miracle of Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit against slander by unbelievers. That is the second point. The third point, by naming the baby, he exercises a father's prerogative and officially took him on into his own family as his own son. I like Joseph. He strikes me as a very good man. He was strong when he could have been weak. He was tender when he could have been harsh. He was thoughtful when he could have been hasty. He was trusting when he could have doubted. Joseph, this almost forgotten man in the Christmas story, stands as a model of what godly men should look like. The real test of maturity is not what a person faces in life, nor is it revealed in what they are called to do. The real evidence of a person's character is what they do with what they are handed in life, how they face whatever situation. Now, just look at the tasks that he is handed. He is to be the caretaker of the Son of God, no less. The mind boggles when you think about that. That huge responsibility, huge. He is told to take Mary as his wife and embrace her child as if he were his, his own son. And three, he is also told what to name the child. The toughest assignment Joseph is given that any human being could be asked to do. Be a caretaker for the Son of God. He was to nurture him, love him, train him, teach him a trade. What patience, what fortitude he would need I'm quite sure that Joseph's not quite sure what's happening to his life. 
His life is in a bit of turmoil, and he's not quite certain about what's happening, but, but I think he got enough to know that God had just transformed what he considered his worst tragedy, his worst nightmare, into what would be his greatest blessing. What a surprise that must have been when he finally realized that. That's often how it is in life. All we can see is what's happening in front of us in our daily lives. We don't see the bigger picture, but God does. He sees the end from the beginning. All right. We've looked at Zacharias. We've looked at Mary. Now we've looked at Joseph and the tasks that he has handed. Let's look at the testimony that measured his life. Because in his response to the tragedy and the task that he is given, we get a glimpse of this man's character and his testimony. Two things stand out. One is unconditional obedience. When he realizes what the angel has told him, he believes this is a God-fearing man and a just man. He believes. And he's... Obedience is unconditional and unwavering. Unwavering commitment to carry out the task that he is given. As soon as he awoke, it says, he arose and carried out the command of the Lord. Now, at this moment, Joseph was not interested in what the community thought about him. And there would be questions raised about this couple that could not wait until after they were married. He simply wanted to carry out the will of the Lord. He simply sets out in faith to obey the Lord and his unwavering commitment is shown in the fact that he restrained himself from any relations, sexual relations with Mary until after the child was born. Here is a man who is willing to bear the shame of and reproach leveled at him by the community and to place his own rights and needs and desires on the back burner. And when the child is born, he takes the next step of faith and names him Jesus, just as he'd been commanded by the angel to do. And he wants nothing more than to do the perfect will of God. And as far as we know, Joseph never faltered as he perfectly carried out the commands of God for his life. In fact, in spite of the fact that he'd been asked to believe the impossible, the virgin birth, and to do the incredible, to be the carer and trainer and foster father of the Son of God. What a testimony. A certain writer wrote about this whole thing and he wrote and put the words into a poem which was later made into a song. Let me read it to you. These would be some of Joseph's thoughts, I guess. How could it be that this baby in my arms Sleeping now so peacefully, the Son of God, the angel said, how could it be? Lord, I know he's not my own, not my flesh, and not my bone. Still, Father, let this ba baby be the son of my love. Father, show me where I fit into this plan of yours. How can a man be father to the Son of God? Lord, all my life I've been a simple carpenter. How can I raise a king? How can I raise a king? He looks so small, his face and hands so fair. And when he cries, the sun seems to disappear. But when he laughs, it shines again. How could it be? The wonder of Joseph must have been something. But we don't know much about him, this forgotten man. All through our lives, we face difficulties and situations 
But we know this, that God has a plan for our lives. Whether we are young, as Mary was, a teenager, or middle-aged, as Joseph was, or old age, as Zacharias and Elizabeth were, God has a plan for our lives. There may be some rough places along the way, but you know, genuine faith never seeks the easy road. John 16, 33 says, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And there is a statement that I want you to remember. Look it up if you like. Remember it. From, from uh, Ministry of Healing, page 479, and it says this, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose that they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. I'll read that again. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. You mean right now? Yes, right now. We are fulfilling, when we are faithful to God, we are fulfilling the purpose that God has for us. God took a simple, humble, unknown teenage virgin girl from Nazareth to take part in the most unbelievable and incredible world the, the event that the world has ever seen. God took a poor, humble carpenter and gentlemen, you can put any trade there that you like or any occupation. He took a humble carpenter to carry out one of the most incredible and responsible tasks any human was ever asked to do. Remember, Jesus was willing to humble himself from the highest position in heaven uh, to take on humanity, live here amongst poverty, to suffer and die for our sins. And while we live in some of the most challenging times in this day and age, we live in challenging times. There's no doubt about it. This past year has been a disaster for a lot of people and a puzzlement for a lot of people. And we don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. God is in control. Never fear. God is in control. And God is still looking for people to follow him and take on the tasks that he assigns them. Little tasks. Big tasks. Take on the tasks that he assigns them and to bear the right testimony for him. A thought comes to my mind right now. You know, we often talk about justification and sanctification. And justification is the forgiving, forgiveness for our sins and the pardoning grace of God. But what about sanctification? That's the work of a lifetime. And there's a statement that comes from Christ Object Lessons. I think it was page 360. And it goes like this. Sanctification, this is part of the, of the statement. Sanctification consists in the cheerful performance of the daily duties of life in perfect obedience to the will of God. Really? Sanctification consists in the cheerful performance of the daily duties of life in perfect obedience to the will of God. It's part of our character development. As simple as that. Sweeping the floor, washing the dishes, cleaning the house, taking the weeds out of the garden. Sanctification consists in the cheerful performance of the daily duties of life in perfect obedience to the will of God. That's what came to my mind now as I was thinking about this. He's asking you, God is asking you and I to carry out our witness 
in our daily lives to all those that we come in contact with. And even though we may not achieve fame and fortune, and even though we may be like the forgotten man of Christmas, we have the assurance that we may have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the assurance. We may have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which is far more important than any fame or fortune on this earth. This is the message from the forgotten man of Christmas. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for the revelations and thy word and the many blessings that are here for us. We ask, Lord, that thou will bless us in our daily walk with thee, our daily lives, that we may be an example not only to our families but to those that we come in contact with and that our testimony may be one that will lead others to thee. Help us in the uh, sometimes difficult, cheerful performance of the everyday duties of life. We ask these things not because we are worthy, but in Jesus' name. Amen.